This is Andrew Jones of Climate Interactive here for the En-ROADS update for December 2020. Our team here at Climate Interactive, of course, works with MIT Sloan Management School's Sustainability Initiative. And we're going to update you about the latest in En-ROADS. And this is work done by this partnership, but in particular, this amazing team here at Climate Interactive, uh, the technical team, you can see all the folks below and some others as well, working hard to bring you this simulator. If you're new to En-ROADS, we suggest go watch the video tour because we're not gonna introduce the model much. This is for people who've seen it before, who wanna see what's new with this release that's coming out right now. And everything in here, all the technical information is captured in a blog post on our website. Go check out the blog post if you wanna learn more about uh, all the details of what, we, what we're doing. We have a summary of what's going on, and we also have a deeper dive into the science of it. Um, if you want to do, learn more about using the simulator, we really invite you to come take the training program. We're training En-ROADS climate ambassadors around the world. There are 253 of them in 46 countries and 29 languages, educators and business people and policy people, all sorts of folks, community members, community leaders. Come sign up and uh, join the training program. And today, really, I'm speaking to you, though, in three roles. Our En-ROADS Climate Ambassadors are facilitators. So maybe you're one of those folks who uses En-ROADS to make a difference in the world. And you probably want to know, well, what's different? What does it mean for my work? Secondly, as a scientist, you should be listening hard. How do you build confidence in a model? How do you make these changes with the kind of rigor that's necessary when you are talking about a simulation model of such an important issue. So listen with that skeptical ear of a scientist, and I'll show you a bunch of tests that we did that should speak to that side of you. And the third, so we have some cool insights about systems thinking, in particular, the role of reinforcing loops to drive growth in renewable energy and address climate change. Cool systems insights. The real spark, though, is number two, is us as scientists there are two steady efforts here at Climate Interactive. One, you never step in the same river twice and you never read the same climate energy, ag, equity, justice literature twice because it's always changing. It, so we're always trying to update En-ROADS in light of new discoveries out in the science world and you'll hear some today. The second is the long-term work of stitching together research from different databases and research teams that speak different, well, use different approaches. We're trying to pull those approaches together. In particular, you'll listen later for what is the definition of pre-industrial that really mattered a lot to this update. So those are the commitments, the efforts that we're committed to. Um, you'll hear them come up. That's why we have the work that we're sharing today. So the summary of the changes. Here are the changes in the update. First, lower future baseline temperature. When you open up the new version of En-ROADS, you will see not this, this is the old version of En-ROADS, 4.0, excuse me, 4.1. Last month, that was where the temperature was headed by 2100, a temperature increase of, of 4.1 degrees C, 7.3 degrees F. You'll see now, if you go right now and open up En-ROADS, it has a new baseline temperature. I'm going to explain to you how we came to change the baseline temperature, what that means. Secondly, you're going to see different default graphs. Here are the default graphs. I mean, you may have noticed that the old version, what we had, were this one and I think temperature over here was how we showed it before. Here are some of the things that we really like and how you can use the new default graphs. So this has stacked coal, oil, gas, renewables, etc. It's a little easier to distinguish between them because they don't have crossing lines and so on. A little more attractive. And also it reveals some new information when you reduce emissions in some way. You notice the top of the stacked area shrinks. That is the total primary energy demand. And when you change it, you will see that difference. 
this reveals information that the old graph did not. So how you use it is, this is one of the causes of greenhouse gas net emissions over here in the right graph. The blue line is the new scenario. The black line is the baseline. And you can use it to say, if this happens on the left, it causes this, and then over on the right, you get the temperature. So it has a causal story from left to right. That's one of the things that we like about this new setup. You have more control of economic growth rates. Down here at the bottom, when you're changing economic growth, and you open up the advanced view, you're going to be changing the long-term economic growth rate, GDP per person. That is what percent per year. It's growing at one and a half percent a year. You can change that, of course, to be lower or higher. And look over on the right, the bottom right, you can see what happens to gross world product, higher or lower. But now we're also allowing you to change the near-term economic growth rate. So, and the transition time, that is how long it takes to go from 1.5% a year over to 2.5% a year. This allows you to have explore lower growth rates down here or higher growth rates as well. So these are the changes on uh, economic growth. The fourth is that we have a more concrete measure of the population growth rate. Uh, under here, we used to have an index, you may remember. Now we have this really cool measure where it shows you exactly how many billion people there would be in 2100 under the scenario that you choose. The range is still the same. This is the 95% confidence interval range modeled by the UN from the lowest, 9.1 billion in 2100. Look over here, you can see the blue lines is 9.1 billion in 2100. Up to the higher end with higher fertility rates, etc., lower death rates. And that is heading up towards 13.2 billion. Just a more concrete way to see what the overall population will be. The fifth is that we changed new technology, those words, to new zero carbon. People thought that when you went here and you changed new technology in the old version, what they thought you'd get CDR, you'd get electrification. No, it's only a new supply of energy that is zero carbon. One note along the way, if you go over to our C-ROADS model, that is a disaggregated by country, not by solution and technology, it's been updated as well. So why the new baseline temperature? What are the causes of it? Well, the short version is wind and solar. Renewable energy is growing much, much faster. And it's really good news for the world that this is happening. Here's what it looks like in En-ROADS. This is a graph from 2000 to 2100 of all the production, primary energy demand from renewables. This is the baseline of 2018. I'll call it the old baseline. And now the new baseline, growing faster to be a much higher level, um, old and new and old and new. It's growing much faster. That's the main contributor to the lower baseline temperature in 2100. But there are actually several things afoot. Uh, I just mentioned to you, we, we were at 4.1 in the old version, 2018 baseline. The result of wind and solar growth keeps more coal and gas, a little bit of oil in the ground. That chops off 0.4 degrees C. But there are two other factors that I'm going to tell you about later. One of them is that there's uh, we've departed our calibration to the integrated assessment models version of the SSPs that used um, they used 1700s, mid 1700s as baseline period excuse me, as the pre-industrial period. And now we're using um, the mid 1800s, which is much more prevalent in the world of policy and in the setting of the two degree target for the Paris Agreement, et cetera. That reduced temperature another 0 0.16 degrees C. A third change is that we updated the effect of aerosols, soot, clouds, and what are called other forcings to match the latest scientific understanding of those forcings, and that pushed temperature back up 0.1 degree. The net of it all is that the temperature dropped in 2100 from 4.1 down to 3.6 due to these three forces. And I'll show you one by one each of those impacts. Now, it's important that I really define what we mean by a baseline. And for us, a baseline is a weak action, not a no action, but a weak action future that's used as a 
pretty reasonable starting point for doing the tests that you do in the simulator. People ask us, does it include the China net zero pledge by 2060? No, it doesn't include pledges or targets. It does not include the NDCs, the pledges to Paris, nor national policies that could be sustained. It does not include any of those. Um, and it also is not a no action policy. The, the baseline put forward by the IPCC's AR5 Working Group 3 report is about 4.1 to 4.8 degrees. That's really a no action policy. We're calling this weak action because things are happening in the world, uh, but uh, not to the level of current policies or pledges and targets. Note, this is really important, you guys. Our baseline is not a prediction, our prediction of the most likely future. We don't do that. The uh, International Energy Agency does some predictions about energy sources out to 2040. We just don't do predictions of the most likely future. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty about how the biogeochemical system is going to behave over time that leads to much uncertainty about the future. So here we are at 3.6. What if, and there are all sorts of what ifs, that would affect one important factor here in the model, the climate sensitivity to a doubling of carbon, the effect of clouds, methane, permafrost, you know, the albedo feedback loops could lead this number of three to be a little lower, which means the temperature might be as low as 3.4 or higher, as four or even higher or even lower. There are a lot of uncertainties about how the biogeochemical system behaves. Uh, some of them can be changed explicitly here in the model. The point is that uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Also, 3.6 is better, but it still would be devastating. Do not think our work is done because uh, the new baseline is half a degree lower. Okay, so for you as facilitators, thinking about, so what does this mean? I'm teaching a class, I'm leading this a session for my legislators, for my executive team, for my community. <clears throat> Here are the two big implications for you as a facilitator. What you'll see is that less extreme policies, investments and actions are needed in order to reach climate goals like two degrees. No surprise, it used to be that the baseline was at 4.1, now it's 3.6 here starting your race kind of ahead of the game now. Uh, and here's what that looks like <clears throat> in the model. I'm gonna just do a, a demonstration of what that looks like. So here's the old baseline. I'm gonna make the old baseline look like the new baseline with its graphs, <clears throat> the old version. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's just assume there's a lot of action in agriculture and carbon removal and forestry, etc. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say, oh, here we are taking a lot of action. We're growing trees, we're cutting deforestation. We have a lot of carbon removal, of a huge amount. I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm just saying, imagine that we did that here in the old baseline and in the new baseline, the same. So we're gonna have the same amount of action in those areas in both of the models. Then how much is needed additionally to get to a goal like two degrees? Well, here we were in the old version of the model. And I'm gonna explore carbon price. How much of a carbon price would be needed to get from 2.9 down to two degrees? Well, let's see. 15, that's not enough. 32, not enough. 50, need more. 70, 86, no, nope. 106. So it took 106 dollar carbon price to get us to two degrees given all that other action. So remember that number. 106. In the old version, it took $106 a ton. New version, here's where we are. Let's try the same experiment. What does it take? $13, not enough. 27, nope. 39, 51, yep. 51. So about 100 the first time, now 50. As you can see, like I just asserted, it takes slightly extreme policies, in this case, a less extreme carbon price to reach the climate goal of two degrees. You'll find it's just a little bit easier in the simulator. Now note, nothing changed in the real world over the last week, but this is the result in the simulator. Um, one note, instead of a carbon price, we could have gotten the same place with other things such as energy efficiency, and you could have done the same experiment that wasn't just about carbon price. 
you can see how much carbon this to take it would take to get to 2.1 instead of here in the new one where it takes less energy efficiency to get us down to 2.1 degrees you can see the same result from that experiment okay it takes less extreme policies to get to reach the climate goal secondly what you'll notice when you play with the model is that actions that previously reduced future warming by cutting coal and gas will show less impact so think of that dream policy that you might have fallen in love with and you learned here's what it did and you're so ready for En-ROADS to show exactly the result that you've always seen it might be a little different so let's do a quick experiment here uh, there's a policy of where you say no new coal stop building new coal infrastructure in 2025 watch the brown area shrink and you see that 4.1 goes down to 3.6 that policy in the old version of the model cut half a degree so remember that number 0 0.5 0 0.5 this policy cut 0 0.5 now you're going to go to the model and you're going to say well i'm going to try something I love this because it cut half a degree in the old version. It cut half a degree. Are we ready? Watch the half a degree. 3.6 went to 3.3. That's 0.3 degrees. So in the old version, it cut 0.5. Now it cuts 0.3. As I just said, actions that reduce future temperature by cutting coal and gas now show less impact. You'll find that for some gas policy. You'll find that for carbon price other things such as that. So go try it yourself and see if you find you get the same result and just be ready as a facilitator that these are the two main differences in this newly updated version of the model. Okay, so that was your summary. That's the main things we think you need to know. However, I'm gonna keep going because there's a lot more, particularly for those scientists out there who wanna think about how the heck did they come up with this? and. What is the confidence building approach, et cetera? So here's a little bit of what I wanna share that led us to these changes. This is the data for the marginal cost of solar from 1990 out to 2019, just last year. And it shows data from the IEA of how much, look how much that's fallen. Price has fallen, 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 fallen over time. And Lazard is another source. And they have shown an 89% drop in prices over just these last 10 years. And here's Irina in green. In the same way, wind has dropped significantly. The cost of wind has fallen significantly over time, a 70% drop in prices over the last 10 years. So I just want you to think, like given those falling prices, just think for a second, how did that change the growth of wind and solar so much? And what do I mean is, look at falling prices, but out into the future, that data was just through 2019. So the data you just saw was only through here. And right, that little difference, data through here. And now we think that we're headed towards the thick green line, not the dotted line as a reasonable scenario against which to test our policies at their baseline. How did that change in price? change the future that much in the way that we're thinking and a bunch of additional questions so join us in thinking and scratching your heads what might that mean for coal oil and gas which is going to change the most coal oil or gas and when what happens to emissions and what happens to air quality what does it mean for the effort to meet climate goals join us in thinking about this um, and in thinking about it, we're going to look at the first cause of the baseline change, this 0 0.4 degrees C change. Um, here's how we modeled it to answer those questions I was just asking you. Here's the falling price of solar. Here's wind again. Also, here's the growth we've seen in electricity generated by solar. Look at that exponential growth growing at an increasing rate. The more you have, the more you get. Look at that growth, exponential. Growing at an increasing rate. Wind as well, exponential growth. Growing at an increasing rate. What we do with systems thinking and what we do with our system dynamics model that underneath is underneath it is explicitly model with equations the feedback structure that we hypothesize is driving the growth that you just saw. 
I'm giving you a summary of the feedback loop that we've modeled and uh, I'm going to walk you through what's going on there and it's relevant to understanding the model. It's also just help you as a systems thinker to understand the nature of these feedback processes and their power to make change in the world. The first causal effect is that renewable costs as they go down increase production. That arrow means that this first variable causes the second variable. The more production we get, that builds over time cumulative experience. Experience producing solar panels or wind power. Field experience installing them in the world. Public acceptance. People don't think that they're just a fringe technology, but they actually work. Research and development lowering their costs, but also the supporting businesses and maintenance infrastructure and laws and financing, all the things that need to go along with it build over time. As there's more experience, that drives the cost down. That is a reinforcing feedback loop, that's why there's an R there, that we call economies of scale. We call this like going down the learning curve is the way this is often described. There's a factor that's important in the model called the learning rate, and that sets the strength of the loop. And right now in the model and in the math within the system dynamics simulation En-ROADS, every doubling of cumulative installed capacity, that is you go from 10 gigawatts to 20, reduces the price by 20%. And that is captured as the progress ratio in the En-ROADS simulator, I'll show you in a minute. That shows that is the strength of the loop. There's another factor, which are the subsidies. And subsidies, the government says, the Chinese government, the European Union, the US government, and others will just give tax rebates. They will also fund research and development. They will externally reduce the price. That increases the growth in the loop. It doesn't change the strength of it, but can increase the growth of the loop. And one note, I talk about this as a variables, but there are people in this loop, of course. There are people who are re reacting to this cost drop and starting installation businesses in the utility scale or residential scale. There are engineers who are applying the experience to reducing the cost at the production level. There are regulatory people and corporate people and community people fighting for more, their, more production and installations. There are all sorts of people who are reacting to these signals in this feedback loop. One way to think about the feedback loop is that this reinforcing loop behaves like a snowball rolling down a hill, growing in size, rolling faster. And the two factors I just showed you, the learning rate is the slope of the hill. That is the strength of that loop is how fast that growth will go, the strength of the loop, but also there's a subsidies it's similar in Beth Sowen pointed out this nice analogy that it's kind of like how hard we push the snowball at the top of the hill. Now, the implications of this are partly about renewable energy, but the promise of this is that renewable, excuse me, that reinforcing loops can drive both important change in the world of things that we want, that things grow and building on their own growth, reinforcing processes. They also, like say the spread of an infection like COVID-19, reinforcing loops can also be very damaging in the world and they can improve, create exponential growth like is happening in the world right here in December, 2020. You can see this effect in the simulator itself in some of the graphs. And why don't we just look at them and see those graphs themselves. So I'm gonna, undo where I was before. Let's go look at some of these graphs. Uh, the cost itself, cost of electricity, and over here we're going to look at the uh, final energy of renewables. So I told you the cost of a, a renewables production, wind and solar, has been falling. Look at the green line. This is dollars per kilowatt hour, the green is wind and solar, falling steadily over time relative to coal, oil, gas, and others. There it is falling, just like I told you. And this is the, the period that tracks the data. Over on the right, you can see the exponential growth of renewables 
in the world. So here you can explicitly see that feedback loop. Because of this, we get cumulative experience that brings the cost down. Cost comes down, it's cheaper, more investment in renewables. Here's the feedback loop. You can change the strength of the feedback loop and see what would its implications be. Go under assumptions, progress ratio, I told you a 20% drop with every doubling of cumulative capacity. All of that is explained here. The sources are right here. 20% is one minus this number of 0.8. If the learning were faster, say 21, 22%, this would actually be a little bit faster. So watch as I reduce the learning. Oh, I'm changing new cards at zero carbon. Excuse me, that's, that's the wrong one. Um, it's renewables that I wanna change here. I wonder why it didn't change. Okay, watch the green line as we reduce the progress ratio, that is have a faster learning rate. Did you see what just happened? Watch the green line as it falls, green line falls steeper. If it falls steeper, the ball, the snowball falling, rolling faster down that hill, we get more growth. And you just saw the light blue line depart from the black line, more growth. Of course, it could go the other way. If the world, thinking to my colleagues at Rocky Mountain Institute, if they didn't invest in the learning in this loop and all the pro producers didn't, and we had slower learning, then you get less drop in cost less growth. So that's one factor, and I'm gonna bring us back to the baseline. That's the learning rate, progress ratio, but we also have a chance to subsidize renewables into the future. We can't change it in the past, but here we are changing it off into the future and getting more growth by subsidizing renewables. You can see what the effect is into the future. Okay. This is the structure, and I want you to understand this about how we built the model, but also as systems thinkers, what are opportunities to create growth and what you want to see in ways that it builds on itself. It's beautiful how a small change like subsidies in a short period of time can lead to self-reinforcing growth into the future. In order to capture these changes, we had to disaggregate wind and solar. They used to be aggregated in the old version of the model. Now they're separate. Also geothermal and hydropower. And they have separate dynamics, etc. You can see them aggregated as renewables because we don't like tons of lines on a graph. Also, we added two new factors, uh, subsidies, as I just mentioned, but also soft costs. In history, we noticed that there were times when the costs were uh, a little higher because of the challenge of installation and permitting and siting and getting the government to approve, all those kinds of things. So now we are better calibrated to actual data. Here were those data for wind, and, and here in the blue line is our calibration to the historical costs. And uh, this is the fit. Because we fit the history does not mean the model is right. This is just one of the tests we do in order to build our confidence. Marginal cost of solar, you can see it falling steeply here. Marginal cost of solar, here's the fit, the blue line fitting the actual data from in the history from 20, 1990 to 2019. And then we also have uh, generation, electricity generated by wind. Our fit is pretty good to the IEA historical data and to solar as well. We're capturing that exponential growth. And then overall captured electricity generated by renewables. There are also implications in the rest of the system. More wind and solar, less coal and gas than otherwise would have happened. And our fit to coal is pretty good and gas, pretty good. These are the ways that we build confidence in the model. So here's the overall test of where we were before and after. This is from 1990 to 2019, the actual data and our old baseline, that is the 2018 version of the baseline is the blue line. And you notice our old baseline was a little high in here, a little low here in the last 10 years, but importantly, missing some of the growth, 2005 to 2019. Notice how it's growing. The slope is a little lower in the dotted blue lines in the baseline for En-ROADS than it is in the history. We missed that. We made a bunch of changes. Dr. Lori Siegel and Dr. John Sturman worked really hard on this. 
and then we have the new fit. Look at the thick blue line, tracks the history much better. And importantly, it captures the growth from 2005, the growth rate, the slope of that line. The implications are, look, the old line was heading off in this general direction of this arrow I've added here, as opposed to this one. So heading off into the 2020s, now we're growing at a higher rate. Okay. So let's see, what is that higher rate and how does it compare to other models that are out there? And we still rely heavily upon the integrated assessment models, the complex disaggregated model. This is a chart that uh, Dr. Beth Sawin made to show the difference of those integrated assessment models that GCMs and others, which are high in scope and detail, but are not designed for speed, simplicity, and transparency and ease of use. Uh, Simple models such as En-ROADS complement those and really depend on them for testing. And we'll show you some of that testing. The big change that's gone on is before people who have been studying this model know that we calibrated renewables growth to what was called SSP2. That's the middle of the road SSP baseline scenario from the six main integrated assessment models as of 2018. That's how we picked the renewal, renewables growth. Now we are calibrated more closely to the history from IEA and BP capturing higher rates of growth and we compare to those integrated assessment models and particularly in reduction scenarios, we really depend on them on a lot and others like Shell and DVNGL. So here's the result. We've been looking before at the history. Here's the IEA history and I showed you before our match to that. This now is a graph going all the way to 2100. Um, and we're showing you now the 2050 and 2100 ranges for the integrated assessment models as they simulated SSP2 baseline. You can see the cluster of models, 2050, and then also out here in 2100 for PBL's model and PNNL's and IASA, etc. Here is the old baseline and you may have heard that we calibrated, we wanted to be within the cluster of those models. Now we're capturing, remember that steeper growth coming out of this 20, 2005 to 2019 period with the steeper growth and our new calibration and inclusion of the subsidies that get that snowball rolling a little faster, faster growth, the green line heading off here, higher all the way up above most of the integrated assessment models in the new baseline. So before, after. And we thought we would just add in here where we sit relative to the International Energy Agency policies. Their current policies of 2018 and the stated policies scenario is that yellow dot here. Those are with uh, policies. Ours is, of course, a weak policy future, not uh, all the stated policies, but that's where we fit. We thought we'd also add another one because we'd like to compare our policy tests. This adds another graph where we subsidize renewables in the future. See the solid green line compared against some of the reduction scenarios. So look over here on the right, SSP2 is the middle of the road scenario. 2.6, that's the radiated forcing. That's a two degree-ish scenario. So this is comparable to the two degree scenarios. And we also thought we'd look at where do we sit with this subsidized renewable scenario relative to the well-known Shell Sky scenario in 2050. You can see we're close to it, but below and pretty similar in 2100. And then also DNVGL's um, energy transition outlook, a little bit below them in 2040 and a, well above the sustainable development scenario of the IEA. So they're just some, some comparisons that we use when we see where we sit in the family of other models. So remember I asked you this question before, how much faster might wind and solar grow? I showed you the effect of that reinforcing loop, but what might that mean for oil, coal, and gas? Which one changes the most? So I'm both gonna show you some comparisons for coal, oil, and gas, but also which changed the most? This is 2000 to 2100 for coal use. The, again, we have the IEA, we have the integrated assessment models for SSB2 baseline, 
2100 and 2050, and then our old baseline, as we told you, we calibrated to that scenario, those scenarios. Now, I'm gonna show you the new baseline. Because there's more wind and solar competing for electricity demand, we have less coal. Look at that uh, thick brown line, before, after, before, after, before, after. And so you can see, just notice the, the, the gap between the two and you can see and compare that against oil and gas. That, um, we now have significantly less coal. With natural gas, here's the same kind of comparisons. And then less you sit, notice though, the gap is somewhat smaller than it was for coal. So uh, there was more competition with coal than gas. Less than an effect on gas, but still a significant one. And now oil. With oil, very small effect. Why is that? Well, wind and solar predominantly make electricity. And um, that's not what oil is used for. Uh, use liquid fuels for uh it, oil is a liquid fuel used in transportation primarily. This does, uh, wind and solar do compete in electrified transport that had an effect here. Okay, so less of an effect on oil. Pretty significant effect over here on air quality. I asked you about that before. Um, where we were before, I'm gonna show you the old scenario. Here we were with the old baseline. And if we look down here into impacts, this is something that's particularly important to people today. The benefits from reducing PM 2.5 emissions on air quality, particularly on improving environmental justice, could be really significant if the wind and solar shuts down coal where vulnerable populations live. See what the numbers could be. Here is air pollution from energy. Just notice this number, it's heading out towards about 60 megatons PM 2.5 per year from energy under the old baseline, 60. Remember that number of 60. New baseline, here we are gonna see the new baseline down here for, it's not going up to 60, it's only going up to about 40. So a significant reduction and a significant reduction soon uh, in these first years when we're able to keep more coal in the ground, less PM 2.5 soot emissions causing heart disease, lung disease, emphysema, other problems such as that. So pretty significant impact on air quality. Okay, so that wraps up why we have an impact on the baseline temperature from wind and solar. The second factor is this 0.16 of the definition of pre-industrial. So as I sh we showed you, uh, we calibrated to the data sources that the SSP2 baseline calibrated to, which are called GISS, G-I-S-S, and Hadley in green and in purple. This is the historic data, 1990 up to 2019. Here's the data over time. There are the integrated assessment models, SSP2 baseline right there in yellow in the middle, and they were relative to a pre-industrial definition of the mid-1700s. And that led to an interesting result that isn't used in the media or much in the policy world where this 2020, 2019 temperature was above 1.2 degrees above. Uh, mostly when you hear people talk about it, they say that, well, temperature has risen about 1.1 degree. So we took a look at that um, here's where we, cal we calibrated En-ROADS. Of course, this has the, the Pinatubo effect back here in 1990. That's the volcano. Sprayed sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere and um, cooled the earth. This is where the calibration was before. However, we looked at the data of if we measured temperature change relative to the mid-1800s, which is much more common in the policy world, such as in the UNFCCC's Paris Agreement language. Look at the difference. The Now the green and purple lines for Hadley 2020 relative to the 1800s is a little bit lower. So we calibrated to those data and now have a lower temperature increase by 2019. So here we were, the 2018 version had a higher temperature increase 
historically, 2020, a somewhat lower one because we changed the definition of pre-industrial to fit better the way the policy world talks about it. The third effect to the change to the baseline is the 0.10 updated effect of aerosols, soot, clouds, other forcings, many other forcings. The science is always changing and we were able to get some research that led us to believe that we were gonna change the effect of these non-greenhouse gas forcings. The effect of the sun, and volcanoes, black carpet on snow, albedo effect, that's like the light bouncing off of clouds, et cetera, and aerosols. That caused the final 0.1 degree. So on net, we were at 4.1, we had the reduction from wind and solar growth, keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground, then the change to the pre-industrial definition, and the other forcings. The net is this half a degree change between the old baseline and the new. So those are the big three contributors to the baseline temperature changing. Um, and if you want to learn more in particular how to use this model, we're going to be running another training in real time in February. Please join us and take the eight part training series. 253 people have gone through the whole thing and taken the test and gone through the whole application process. 46 country, 29 languages, or you can just be a facilitator of it without signing up to be an ambassador. But we really hope you go to the sign up page that's here and join in learning how to do an excellent job of making change with this interactive simulator. More background is here with the video tour and the blog post that explains everything that I just said. So that's the end. We really hope that you can use En-ROADS to go make a difference out there in the world.